thanks for having me back again. Uh, I usually do workshops, presentations with you on nutrition, but I'm switching hats today and talking about traveling with a disability. Um, it definitely has its unique challenges. Any of you who may have been hearing or listening to CBC Radio this morning, they were certainly addressing it and it's great they were because there's still lots of challenges that need to be addressed. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you some tips, tips and strategies um, based on my own personal and professional experience over the last 34 years traveling with a disability. Um, but before we get started on some of the strategies, I wanna give you a little bit of background. If we can go to the next slide, please, Mira. Um, let's see, there we go. There we go. Thank you. So I've always had a love of travel, a love of adventure. Here's some pictures from me over the decades um, before I broke my back in a car accident. Uh, I was really fortunate. I had parents who came from Scotland and from England, and we had a lot of family still there. So we used to go back to England and Scotland and Europe quite often to visit them and spend summers there. And I think it really developed my my passion for travel. I loved all the different architecture, the different foods, the culture, the history, the accents, and maybe not the cuisine in the, in the UK. But I just I just love being somewhere and learning about all the different surroundings. Um, and you can see another another uh, picture there on a boat. I was traveling and sailing on a, a tall ship, a Polish tall ship around the Great Lakes one summer. And um, the other picture there in Edinburgh Castle, that was me just six months before I broke my back. My best friend there in the jean jacket, her and I were knapsacking for four months all around Europe and before I went to university and had my accident. So I definitely love to travel and did lots of it before my injury. And then when I, I broke my back in first year, year university and I'm now using a manual wheelchair. And if we can go to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, when I went back to school uh, after a number of years and got out of rehabilitation, I became a television reporter, producer and host. Uh, one of the TV shows and stations I worked for was CBC. And I worked at television for over 15 years. And the shows that I worked on were on disability issues across Canada. And so even in my job as producer and host and reporter for CBC, I traveled back and forth across Canada. I went to every province numerous times. I went to small towns and cities that I'd never even heard of. And it was, it was an amazing experience, again, to travel. I went and covered the Paralympic Games in Sydney, Australia and Salt Lake City. And I would also go talk about disability issues uh, on behalf of CBC at conferences around the world, um, places like Moscow. So it, it really heightened my awareness too about traveling with a disability to other countries once I was in, in a wheelchair. And what I really learned in doing this show and traveling so much and working with different people with different disabilities is that truly anything is possible when there is a will. There is a way, and it certainly applies to, to traveling. And I've really never let my wheelchair stop me. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in my personal life and my professional life, I've certainly done lots and lots of travel. This was one of my first trips to Africa about um, maybe almost 20 years ago. On this first trip, we did six safaris in five different countries, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Kenya and Tanzania. We did think 17 flights in the one month that we traveled around these, these five countries. And it was an amazing experience. And I've gone back to Africa twice since. If we can go to the next slide, please. I've gone back to, I went down to, I went to Egypt and did a, a cruise down the Nile. And then I was back in Namibia. I did four safaris in Namibia right before the pandemic hit, just a few months before I spent about a month there. And we were in some of the most remote places in the world and it was incredible. And believe it or not, 
I found some really great accessibility in some of these countries. Um, in Egypt, for example, going to see the pyramids and the ruins, the way they built the pyramids, they actually needed ramps. So they actually built these with ramps. So when you go to some of these old ruins and the pyramids, it's quite accessible to get around because it's been like that for thousands of years. They knew in order to build these incredible structures, they needed to actually roll them. So it works for the wheelchair. And in some of the places um, that I went, like on the Skeleton Coast in, in Namibia, the actual lodges are all on one level and they really incorporate universal design in a lot of the countries I've been to in Africa, which I just find incredible because we don't apply a lot of universal design here, even to a lot of our new builds. So when you have a room in one of these lodges, the bathrooms are all open concept, no steps. They're incredibly accessible. So um, I just want to share some of these stories with you so you can see that really anything is possible if you have certain destinations in mind. If you really do some searching, you'd be amazed at how much accessibility you can find. In Namibia too, was one um, little airstrip we went to in the middle of the desert. They had an accessible washroom and it, it just, it was incredible to see that in the middle of a desert, they had men's washroom, women's washroom, and then a private accessible washroom. So it's definitely out there. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So in my um, other travels here, I have been all over North America. I've been South America, Australia. I've been all over Europe, uh, Caribbean. And here's just a spattering of some of the pictures of different places I've been. And I actually now, I work as a, a, con, a consultant. I work with the Canadian Transportation Agency. And I work with a number of other disability organizations, organizations across Canada. And we are working with the CTA, Canadian Transportation Agency. We're working together with this government organization to help try and ensure that all aspects of travel in Canada, whether it's air travel, bus travel, um, ferry travel, train travel, that it's as accessible as possible. And when we're looking at the travel industry and all these different formats and realms, we are looking at everything from travel communication, when you first book your ticket, book your flight with a travel agency or a third party agency, even like your bank, if you're using points, we're looking at the airlines and their training programs for ground crew and lifting individuals on or off airplanes, the edu to the education of employees with the proper etiquette when you're working dealing with someone with a disability, as well as all the physical aspects of accessibility within airports, um, it's an aircrafts as well to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities. So I've been doing this for a number of years. And I have to say, it's encouraging to see the Canadian government is putting a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of education to making travel in Canada more accessible. But I will absolutely say we're nowhere near where we should be when I travel to other countries, and I'll give the example of the United States, it is a dream going to the United States because they have very strong accessibility laws. They have what's called the American Disability Act. It's been around for about 30 years, and it really makes a difference to finding accessible locations, hotels, airports, you name it. I find when I land in the US, and I've been in the US twice over the last two weeks, it's like a dream, you land, it's like a weight's lifted off your shoulder because you know wherever you go, you're going to find accessibility. And it's not the same here in Canada, but we're working on it. So as much as I'm involved in trying to make these changes, we still have a, a long way to go. And there are certainly challenges and I'll explain some of the situations I ran into even the last two weeks traveling at Canadian airports. It was, it was disappointing. Um, to some of the things I experienced at this stage where we're at. I've been traveling for 34 years in a wheelchair and to see that we're still not where we should be. It, it can be frustrating, but I want to give you guys some tips and strategies of how to deal with things like I encountered recently and even more importantly, try and prevent them from happening in the planning stages of your journey. So I hope I haven't dissuaded anybody here with some of the things I've mentioned, but the reality is in Canada, we still have a long way to go. So I want to walk you through now some tips to help you have a safer, more enjoyable journey. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what you really wanna do right off the bat is you want to research and plan 
your vacation as much as possible. Thank goodness for online and for websites and all the resources we have now to help us book and search of where to go. So you wanna research and plan, and then you wanna book and reconfirm, reconfirm everything and prepare for any potential mishaps. And then lastly, once you've done all these things, you can sit back, relax, and hopefully enjoy the vacation. So those are the big ones here. And I'm gonna go through these now in more detail about how you can research plan, reconfirm and prepare for any mishaps. So moving to the next slide, please. Okay, so when I travel, one of the first things I look for is to choose as best as possible, the most accessible locations. And some of the best, most accessible locations in the world are places where they've held Paralympic games. So cities like Barcelona in particular, a lot of um, American cities, Australia, like the Sydney Paralympic Games. Um, South Africa is also very accessible. United Kingdom, believe it or not, places like France are very accessible. So start off by looking at some of these places. Um, and the reason is with the Paralympic Games is they have to make things accessible. In order to host a, a, an international event like the Paralympics, you have to ensure you've got accessibility. Barcelona in particular, I have to say, is above and beyond with their accessibility. I've spent time there on my own and had no, no issues going out on my own. Hotels um, and venues and attractions and sites incredibly accessible. So that's the first thing I do is where do I want to go that's going to be wonderful and enjoyable and have adventure, but probably be very accessible. So I look for places like this first. And I've listed some other destinations here, places like South Beach, New Orleans, Savannah, again, Barcelona, cruises. The reason I mentioned these cities again is places like this, you don't necessarily need a car to get around. So you don't have to either rent a car, be jumping in and out of cabs or trying to find an accessible cab. I love to find destinations where you can find a hotel and everywhere you can wheel to, uh, whether it's a site or an attraction or even a beach or a boardwalk, it's within wheeling distance. One of the ones that's not listed on here, and I was actually just, I was down two weeks ago, is Key West. I found a beautiful little um, bungalow in the middle of Key West, and I never needed a car. Again, I was, on, I was there by myself for several days before my friend came to meet me. I could go wheel along an accessible path along the ocean for three hours every day. I could go to any restaurant um, and any, any site I wanted to see, totally accessible. So I look for little pockets like South Beach, New Orleans, Savannah, that has so many sites and restaurants and things you can enjoy and you don't need any kind of extra travel, cab, car. So that's first and foremost, that's one thing I do when I'm traveling, choose the most accessible locations. Next slide, number two. Once you found what city you want to go to, then you want to start looking for hotels. So what I do is I start just Googling best wheelchair hotel and I get the ratings. I look at people's reviews and I pick a few that, that look good to me, look like they're going to suit my needs. Then I start comparing prices, very important, what fits my budget. And then what I do is on every hotel, they have map right? So if you hit the map button, you can see where that hotel is in the city you want to go to. So if I've chosen the city, then I kind of start choosing some sites, some attractions, things I want to see and do while I'm there. So then I want to try and pick a hotel that is within an area that I can wheel everywhere, hopefully to all these places. And so I start looking at the maps. So now I've compared hotels, accessibility, I've compared prices, I've compared location, because I don't want to use a vehicle if I don't have to, I just want to wheel there. And that's what I start doing. And that narrows it down. So when I get down to one or two that I think are really going to work for me location price wise, and then I pick up the phone and I call them. <laughs> so I've looked online at the pictures at their accessible rooms, I can kind of eyeball if I think the washroom is going to work for me. Is it a roll in shower? Is there enough room around the toilet for me to transfer? But then I pick up the phone and I call them because I want to be sure, is that door wide enough? Because this has happened where I booked accessible hotel rooms in faraway locations and I get there and yet yeah, that bathroom is accessible once you get in it, but the door is so narrow, you can't get through it. So I will literally call them and say, can you please give me the dimensions, the width of that doorway and make sure I can get in. And... Once I've done all that, I also then ask them how high the bed is. 
there is a new trend, and I don't know when this started or why, to have very high beds. I don't know if it's like a luxury that they're doing this for, for able-bodied people. They don't work for people in wheelchairs. For me, not anyways. I am a, I'm pretty high-functioning paraplegic. Uh, my arms are pretty strong to lift me into a bed. But when your, your bed is this high, I can't do it. It's like a pole vault to get in it. Um, this happened to me actually maybe about eight months ago. I went to a very accessible hotel in Nashville and wonderful roll-in shower. I checked it out. I'd done all these things. And when I got there, despite them saying the bed was X amount high, it wasn't. It was so high that I had to get my friend to like help me get in it, which was not ideal at all. So the whole hotel actually cut my bill in half. They were so mortified. And while I was there, they were actually searching new beds to buy purchase and install in their accessible rooms. So I very nicely went to the front desk and said, I cannot do this independently. I asked, I called, and they were so gracious by giving me half my money back and, and buying all new beds. So very, very nice. And they also give us all these coupons for free dinners and all sorts of things. So ask about doorways, ask about washrooms, ask about how, how, the, high, how high the beds are. The other thing you can do is in the moment, if you need that bed lower, um, get them to take the box spring out to make it lower or even take the wheels off the bottom of the bed to make it lower. So there's other things you can do. And I certainly will have um, the repair guys come in and dismantle the bed if it's going to make it easier, more independent for me. So these are some really important tips for choosing hotel and making sure it's accessible to your needs. Okay, number three. Moving on, um, this is just some examples of some really accessible places I had in Africa. And again, like when I was searching, going to Africa, I picked through the pictures. Um, and as you can see here, everything is flat. It's all on one level. Um, it was, it's incredible. Like the washroom, if you can see on the top, top level, second picture from the left, this washroom was massive. It had the sink over on one area, a shower, completely roll in, accessible shower on the other side, big toilet that was like just so tall, but also lots of room around it. And it even had a door you can see there that led out to this beautiful deck, all accessible. It was amazing. It wasn't an accessible room. Every single room was like this. And then it led down to the areas that you eat and was all flat, accessible. Um, that was one location on the bottom level there. It's called Shipwreck Lodge. And this is in the um, Skeleton Coast, very deserted part of the world. And they had like little pods, again, every single one, totally accessible. And then between on the sand, they had totally accessible um, boardwalks. It was amazing. It was amazing. And on the bottom level, very far right, you can see a picture of a washroom. This is a washroom I was telling you about that was in the middle of the desert just on this little landing strip you got off this little plane and there's a totally accessible bathroom so you'd be amazed what you can find so i was like i i go on sites i look at the pictures i zoom in to see if this is going to work for me and then again pick up the phone and call so this is just some ideas you can see i've gone to some very remote interesting places and remarkably so accessible so it can be done okay next picture Next slide, please. Um, choosing accessible accommodations. Again, here's to help you with your search. If you don't want to say do a regular hotel, maybe, for, maybe you're looking for a longer term something or you want, maybe you just want the comfort of a, a condominium or a house. Airbnb have a new filter and they just put this in in the fall. I think it was like maybe November, December. And it actually is a filter. It's a wheelchair icon. I love this. You go on there and it weeds through all the accessible places on Airbnb and it gives you all over the world, everything that's accessible. And in order to get this um, filter with the accessible icon on it, you have to be able to check off, um, you know, there's no steps, accessible washrooms, Airbnb won't let your house, your condo, whatever it is, your cabin on this particular filter, unless you hit certain criteria. So I was just, I, I was so excited when I heard about this back in like late fall, winter that I went on there and I've always wanted to go to Costa Rica. And I found two places in Costa Rica, one totally accessible apartment on the beach, super cheap, and one beautiful accessible cabin in the mountains. So I'm actually going there in two weeks. I'll spend some time on the beach, some time in the mountains. But I, without this filter, I never would have found these places. And like they're $100 a night, so cheap. Um, and 
beautiful, like two bedroom places. So um, this is a great new way to search accommodations other than hotels. So kudos to Airbnb. There's also other accessible Facebook sites, um, accessible travel club. You might want to join that on Facebook if you're on Facebook, um, Airbnb adapted. And another really great resource is on Facebook is called Virtual Peers for Paras and Quads. And this gives you tons of information on travel, but also other things like wheelchairs, you name it, they cover it, but they do a lot of stuff on travel here. And I'm constantly picking up travel tips from this Facebook site. So it's so great now what's at our fingertips for searching. So there are some other ideas for you to look at accessible locations, destinations. If we can go to the next slide, please. And this is a place also I found on Airbnb. This is in Puerto Vallarta, condominium. And it wasn't like made accessible, but it happened to just be totally accessible. So again, I got on this Airbnb site, started looking close in, zooming in on the pictures. And it just happened to be this condominium had like indoor outdoor living and had these glass walls that retracted with no steps at all in between. So it was totally open concept living. Every shower just happened to be like walk in, roll in, universal design. It was amazing. I've actually rented this place three times because it's just so accessible. Um, you have your own pool. It, it's it's incredible. So it's it's worth searching around these filters and seeing what you can find. Um, and even places that aren't deemed accessible, some just with universal design these days, especially new condos, they seem to be going this route, which is amazing. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, booking flights. This is a big one. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Okay, so this can this is where things can really go wrong and you know make or break holidays. So when you're first booking your flight, try and find the most direct route. Try and miss avoid any connections if you have to do. Sometimes you can't avoid them depending on where you're going. Other times, if you have a choice, pick the most direct route. One airplane, there is less likelihood of you losing your luggage losing your wheelchair or any other adapted equipment that you have to take with you. Um, since the pandemic, so many people's luggage uh, were getting lost. I now travel with a carry-on bag. I have literally gotten my, my wardrobe down to just Lululemon that roll up tight. And I that's all I pack is a carry-on bag now because I don't want to lose anything. And um, if you can't do that though, if you're taking a suitcase, please always take a knapsack on with you or a bag and have medication in there, catheters, anything that you can't do without if your luggage does go lost for a few days. So I always take extra supplies, all my medication on a carry-on bag, just in case. And certainly these days, luggage is going lost. It's still going lost. So direct flights, carry-on luggage, that's the way I go now. Okay, when you're booking a flight, if you're booking through air miles through your bank or you're going through a travel agent or you're calling direct, always let them know I'm in a wheelchair or I have a disability, I have a mobility aid. Tell them right off the bat so your, your file is flagged, you are a passenger with a mobility impairment. Now, that's number one. That sometimes they miss it though. This broken telephone, you might tell the person. So what you wanna do, <laughs> get to the airport even earlier than they tell you to. I always go half an hour more before they tell you to, so that when I check in, even though I've got carry-on luggage, I always go to the counter and I'm, I announce again, please, this I'm here, I'm in a wheelchair and I need an aisle chair to get on the plane. And I'm a broken record, but trust me, you have to repeat this over and over again. Um, and when you're booking, if you can, if you haven't traveled, on an airplane with a mobility impairment, see if you can get the bulkhead seat. There's just much more room to transfer into that chair, maneuver around, you know, extend your legs so they don't get too swollen on the flight. Um, sometimes they might make you pay maybe $30, a little extra to get that bulkhead seat. It's worth it um, for the ease of convenience, especially if it's a long haul flight, if you're doing overseas. I definitely need it because my legs get sw so swollen and I, it's a risk of blood clots. So. I'll pay the extra money to get that bulkhead seat. Um, when I, so when you get to that accessible counter, you're going to ensure you have your bulkhead seat. Even though I've prepaid for it sometimes online or through my bank when I'm using points, 
uh, you get there and they've given your seat away, believe it or not. So again, ensure, let them know, hi, I'm here, I'm in a wheelchair, I've prepaid for a bulkhead seat, make sure they haven't given it to anybody else if they have, get it back, you'd be surprised, this happens quite a bit. Um, and make sure you keep your mobility device, your wheelchair with you until you get to the door of the airplane. They often try and persuade you when you check in, oh, we'll give you one of our airport wheelchairs and we'll push you down there and we'll take your wheelchair now. No, because it's independence, it's comfort, it's safety, it's your health. These chairs are custom for us. It's best to keep it until you get to the door of the airplane. That way you also know where it is at all times. And you want to keep it there, but you also want to make sure they give you a gate tag for the back of your wheelchair. So when you get to the door of the airplane, there is a tag that clearly says what flight you're on, your name. And like literally when you're at the door of the airplane, they have ground crew that will take it and put it right underneath the belly of the airplane. So that's what you want them to do. That's why I say don't give your chair up when you check in because there's just more time, more room, errors, people forget, things get lost. Keep it with you to the last possible moment. In fact, if you are on a plane that's going overseas and it's got two aisles, so it's a much bigger plane, they have room for one manual wheelchair on there. So if I'm flying on an overseas flight and it's a massive plane, I know I can put it on board. I know I can take it apart and they have room for it and they can carry one chair on board. So let them know that. Let them know that you know. I don't, if it has one aisle down the airplane, they can't. Two aisles big enough? Yes, they can. Tell them, I'd like to put it on board, please. Um, sometimes they might have other um, luggage in there or they might fill that cupboard with something else. Tell them to take it out and put your wheelchair in there. Again, it's safety. You know where your, your chair is at all times. Really, really important. Um, and then the other thing I'd say when you're checked in now, you've got your tag at the back of your wheelchair. You're keeping your chair to the get you get to the door of the airplane. There are special like accessible lines for you to go through so you can whip through security faster. You can whip through um, screening everything faster. So look for the wheelchair signs. They're usually the signs that are also with the airline crew. So you can go through them and it just gets you through the lines much, much faster. Often there'll be someone there to help you point, escort you. So these are just some, some tips. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, so we've covered about getting to the gate um, when you check in. Now, once you've gone through security, and you've gone through customs, you, there's always that other gate you go to before you get on the airplane. Go right up there again and wait until someone gets there. Remind them again, I'm, I'm on this flight, I have a mobility impairment, and if you need an aisle chair, remind them, please make sure the aisle chair is here and please let me do a pre-board. Federal aviation law is that people with disabilities are board first. It's for safety reasons, so you have more time to get on the plane safely and not have people like bumping you and throwing you off balance, putting their, their bags up above. It's also for a matter of your dignity so that you can get on in your own time and do the transfer. It's often not the most graceful thing. So you wanna be able to have that time to do that. So make sure they do a pre-board. They often don't. And I often have to remind them that people with disabilities go on first. Um, there's no harm at this time either when you've asked now for your aisle chair pre-board, just ask them, you maybe have the bulkhead, just say, is there any room up front? It's easier for them, it's easier for, your, for you. If there's extra room availability in business class or first class, they'll often bump you up there. No harm in asking and it's a much more comfortable flight. And again, reduces risk of blood clots because your feet can be extended more. Um, okay, so um, the other thing I would say before in the flight, do a preventative pee. We all know those washrooms are so tiny, it's often hard to go to the washroom on an airplane. So even if you don't think you have to go to the washroom, do a preventative pee, because you never know, because you don't want to be stuck on the plane, suddenly you have to go. And um, when you land, again, you're, you're, if you haven't had, had your wheelchair put in a cupboard on the plane, if it's not a big plane, it's under the belly, remind them as you're starting to descend, the air, air crew, have them call ahead to remind them, please, I need the wheelchair under the belly to be brought to the door of the airplane. Even though it has that gate tag on there that says, bring it to the door. Often when you land, your wheelchair gets thrown on with the luggage and gets carted off to the luggage and it's spinning around the luggage cart, which is not safe. That's how things can get broken. Um, and you want your chair brought back up. So where it went wrong for me, um, just last week I was in Florida, that was great. And then I flew down, I came home and I flew to Texas. 
Um, even though I had asked, you know, before I booked my flight for disability, wheelchair, aisle chair, get on the plane, I checked in three hours early at like 4.30 in the morning, again, said I need an aisle chair, got to the gate right before you get on the plane, said I need an aisle chair, pre-board. When it went to board, they looked at me blankly, pre-board, and I said, great, where's the aisle chair? They had no clue. It was an absolute disaster. It held the flight up by 40 minutes. The pilot was appalled. He was writing reports about the ground crew because they had not done their job. Not only that, when they finally found a chair, it was an incorrect chair. It didn't fit on the airplane. So they had to go find another one. They brought it back again. And then the ground crew didn't know how to lift me. They didn't know how to support the chair. They didn't, once I was on this aisle chair, they didn't know how to lift it on the airplane. It was a disaster. So, um, I ended up calling the company, so the, the, air, the pilot, all the air crew, even the passengers were really upset at what was going on. It was just so appalling. They were all writing letters and were doing reports. I actually called the company that trains these people on the ground crew to say, you need to do a better job. This is a liability. Um, there was a certain situation when they're boarding on the plane, my leg got twisted, almost broke my ankle. Like it was so bad. So you have to take control of the situation. Um, you have to advocate for yourself as well. Um, you know what works best for you. You know your balance points. You know how to best be transferred. You, you direct them. It's your comfort, but ultimately it's your safety. And if you get the sense that people that are help, helping you have not been trained properly, or they actually admitted to me they didn't know what they're doing, that they've never done this before, um, wrong. It, it shouldn't have happened. So I had to direct them and advocate and I actually had to tell them what the laws were on this one. So hopefully that'll never happen again, but you've got to take these precautions. You have to speak up for yourself and protect your safety because things can go wrong. Okay, so next, next slide, please. Prepare for potential mishaps. Um, again, what I was saying earlier, like just in case your luggage does go missing, Take your medications, extra catheters, anything you might need on board with you. So you've got a couple days supply if it takes a couple days for your luggage to get to you. Um, with your wheelchairs, if you have any re removable um, parts like a cushion, armrest that might come out, might fall off, get lost, take them off your chair before they put it under the belly and put it in the overhead because there is nothing worse than having your wheelchair come back and there is pieces missing. And I've learned the hard way. When I say this, I'm like, where's my footrest? Oh, it fell off and they can't find it. Now I'm, I'm away for two weeks without a proper footrest. Um, I've certainly had the instance where I've had my wheelchair broken. Um, they've brought it back to me without a front wheel. Three wheels doesn't get you very far in a wheelchair. So they have to pay for the, they, they have to replace it and um, repair it immediately. So again, advocate for yourself. You can't function without it. There are laws in place to protect you. Find, who's, find the supervisor, find out who's in charge and make sure you either get a replacement wheelchair or you get it repaired immediately. In my case, when I flew was Toronto to Calgary on a work situation, um, I knew a company out there that did wheelchair repairs. I was able to call them. They came right to the airport. They fixed it at the airline's cost. So, um, but just try and prepare for any little mishaps um, that can go wrong. So any movable parts, please take them off, put them in the overhead with you. Okay, and next slide. Um, oh yeah, if you've booked an accessible hotel and it's not available, this happens too. Um, this actually happened to me a couple of years ago. I was, in, uh, I was in Albuquerque. I was in New Mexico. I totally booked everything accessible, got there. There was a medical conference and they'd actually given my, my room away to a physician. So I said, that's okay, ask for it back, give it back to me because they're not disabled, I am. So I'm sure they'll understand, give it back to me. And they wouldn't, they were actually so afraid of offending this physician, they gave given my room to. So I said, give me another room. It was sold out because it's this big medical conference. So what they had to do is put me in their sister hotel next door. It was a much more expensive hotel, nicer. And they actually ended up giving me a suite there at their entire cost because it was their mess up. But they wouldn't have done that if I hadn't insisted that they were going to correct this, either giving me my room that I would booked or this. So again, advocate, advocate. Um, you've got the booking, you've got the confirmation. If they've messed up by giving your room to somebody else, then they have to make allowances. They've got to make it up to you and they've got to pay for it. Um, the other thing also, sometimes if they give you a room that's not quite accessible, 
and it's not wide enough, ask them to give you a suite. Often the rooms, the doorways are just bigger. So that's another something else you can do. And I think that's the end of the presentation there. Let's see. Um, oh yes, okay, some other things. If you use a wheelchair and you're going to Europe or you're going maybe to South America, somewhere where you know there's gonna be a lot of um, either like cobblestones um, or maybe some bumpy locations you might be at. Um, I have a free wheel, which is a third wheel there you can see in the picture. You attach it to your footrest in your wheelchair and you can just go flying over a lot of um, uneven ground. It's freedom, it's amazing. And it just fits onto my carry-on bag. It's great. Um, some countries like the UK, they can actually give you equipment. They give it to you for free. So if you call ahead, whether you need a toilet seat or a scooter, like it's amazing. They, you just book it and they give it to you for free. Like uh, it's, I do that when I go to the UK sometimes, there are shower chairs. So um, it's worth calling around some local destination um, disability centers, medical places and see what they have to offer and what they can either rent you or they're willing to give it to you sometimes. And Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to? Oh yeah, never be afraid to ask for help. Um, I definitely get by with a lot of help from my friends. And so, I mean, I'm traveling there with a bunch of friends and family and they're always there. They know how to help me up and down a step or two, but people are always willing to help. I find if you ask somebody, they're always more than willing to help as long as they don't have a bad back and they're okay. People are, people like to assist. So don't be afraid to ever ask for help getting into somewhere, or, you know, doing something. And that's the end of my presentation.